Hello, I'm Owen Atkinson, Chief Executive at ALCS, and welcome to our first ever Digital Review of the Year. Financially, the last one was a good year for ALCS. The income we received from our licensing was only slightly below our record in 2019 at £36.4 million. And the gross royalties, that's the royalties we paid out to members before deductions, went up by 5.5% to £36.8 million. More than 92,000 ALCS members received a payment during the year, and the net commission rate that we levied to cover our operating costs was similar to 2019 at 8.4%. Globally, our membership is now over 108,000 members, and we now have members in over 115 countries across the world. In terms of our advocacy work, promoting and protecting the rights of writers, many of the concerns that we had in 2019 remain, such as the outcome of Brexit and the ever-present threat of a no deal. So we continue to work as close as we can with our European partners, building relationships that we hope will surmount anything negative that Brexit might bring to all our areas of licensing. Here, however, we did have one setback, in that our government has indicated that it will not implement the European Union Directive on Copyright in the Digital Single Market, legislation that would have had some positive financial outcomes for UK writers. This notwithstanding, however, we continue to lobby and to advocate for a fair deal for writers and for fair remuneration. Of course, what we hadn't bargained for was COVID-19. The pandemic and the lockdown that ensued has affected all areas of ALCS licensing, both in the UK and overseas. And the impact of COVID-19 on the world economy will have long-term consequences for all our members over the next few years as we try to get to grips with what a new normality will be. You may not be aware, but throughout this period, ALCS staff have been working from home remotely, and this is likely to continue to be the case throughout the winter months. Our cloud-based computer systems are geared towards flexible working and we've become adept at using new technology to deliver our key services. I'm pleased to also report that the two major distributions that we have undertaken during the lockdown period have been seamless. One of the challenges for our board and management has been ensuring staff welfare and here keeping everyone in regular contact, albeit virtually, has really helped all of our ALCS staff members to keep working as normally as possible during the time that they've been away from the office. However, in terms of our license income, we believe there will be a fall in income in all key areas of licensing this year, and as a result, a reduction in the amount that will be distributed to members in March 2021. Due to the impact of COVID, it's also likely to take two to three years of lower distributions before we get back to normal levels. It's very difficult at this time to gauge how big an impact COVID will have on the payments we make to members. At the moment, we estimate the reduction will be under 10% this year, with a larger reduction in 2021. We are, though, doing everything we can to mitigate the current circumstances, and we will keep you informed of developments through our ALCS newsletter, so as the picture becomes clearer, you will have an idea of what to expect. COVID notwithstanding, looking ahead our focus continues to be to put agreements in place across the globe to make sure you get paid for the secondary use of your work, wherever and whenever they are used. And we'll be advocating on your behalf, as always, to ensure that the voice of the writer is heard and that writers' rights are supported. Thank you.
we've met with legislators to raise our concerns about how authors may be affected by Brexit and what they need in a post-Brexit world. ALCS has worked with the All-Party Writers Group to keep issues pertaining to writers on the radar of parliamentarians, including advocating for the key asks of government in its inquiry into authors' earnings, supporting the writers of tomorrow. ALCS continues to raise the importance of intellectual property with MPs and peers via the Film the House Parliamentary Filmmaking Competition. We have advocated the need to protect authors' incomes in light of the COVID-19 pandemic with government across a range of departments. We have worked with the Society of Audiovisual Authors promoting an appropriate and proportionate remuneration for authors in the Digital Single Market Directive in Europe. We have worked with PLR International to promote the principle of PLR systems for authors around the world. ALCS has lobbied with the International Authors Forum at the World Intellectual Property Organization on issues pertaining to preserving authors' rights against issues such as exceptions on education, as well as libraries and archives. Copyright is the enabler that means writers can be paid for their work. But it isn't always viewed in a positive light. So at ALCS we try and educate about the ways that copyright is a real benefit to creators and society as a whole. And we also produce resources for sharing among young people and the wider public to support these beliefs. This year we've updated our copyright education resources and have been sharing them widely through key partners like the National Literacy Trust and the Carnegie and Greenaway Shadowing Scheme, trusted partners who have established relationships with schools and young people. At ALCS, we not only pay individual writers the money we've collected for them and make sure that they get what they're owed, but our board think it really important that we also support the wider writing community. So we set aside a specific fund for writers' causes in the UK. The causes that we typically support will be projects that help further writers' interests, promote cultural diversity, support writers from a wide variety of backgrounds, are aligned with ALCS's ethos and beliefs, and help to ensure that we can share positive messages about copyright and its importance to creators at the same time. This year, one of the key projects that we have supported has been the Society of Authors Contingency Fund, helping writers in need whose incomes have been drastically affected by the pandemic. Hello. I'm Tony Bradman, Chair of ALCS. Welcome to our first ever entirely digital AGM. Well, what a year this has been. This time last year, we probably all thought the controversy surrounding Brexit was bad enough. Little did we know that an even bigger crisis was looming over us. I know at times since March, many of us have felt as if we were trapped in a post-apocalyptic novel. What's happened certainly hasn't made writers' lives any easier. Indeed, for many writers, the effects of the pandemic have been devastating. Contracts and events have been cancelled, launches delayed, income has fallen or even entirely disappeared. Change of any kind can be hard to deal with, but it's even more difficult to handle when it happens so suddenly. Yet despite all the chaos and confusion and worry, we writers continue to do what we do best. We keep writing. There will be more challenges. As is the case for people across all the creative industries, too many writers haven't benefited from the various schemes devised by the government to help those whose incomes have been affected by the pandemic. Those schemes just haven't been nearly creative or robust enough for freelancers and the self-employed. We have lobbied the government and many of you have helped to support our efforts by writing to your MPs. I want to thank you for that today. But then at ALCS, we have always known that writers get results when we work together. Fine words, however, butter no parsnips. One of the first things we did at the beginning of the lockdown was to make a substantial contribution to the hardship fund for writers administered by the Society of Authors. Writers need money if they are to continue to support themselves and their families and also produce the brilliant work which generates billions of pounds for our economy. That's why our commitment to you, the members of ALCS, remains the same and always will in the plague times as well as the good times. It's very simple. 
We will do our utmost to collect the money that is due to you for the use of your work and get it to you as efficiently as possible. The staff at ALCS are incredibly dedicated and hardworking and it's been tough for them this year too. So I'd like to take this opportunity to thank them for their extraordinary efforts in this extraordinary year. They really have gone the extra mile on your behalf and then some. I would also like to thank my colleagues on the board for their hard work and dedication this year. We're all writers on the board, so we really do understand what many of our fellow writers are going through. We will continue to work with Owen and the team to make sure ALCS remains a great company that serves its members. And let us all hope for better days to come. So everyone, welcome and thank you for coming to our 42nd AGM, our first ever to be held online. To start the meeting, I'd now like to introduce our chair, Tony Bradman, who will begin proceedings. Thanks very much, Owen, <clears throat> and welcome everyone um, to our uh, online AGM. It's a very odd uh, sensation. Uh, I would just like to say before we start that we actually have, uh, we've done several run throughs, we've practiced very hard. But as I think we all know these days in, in, in these extraordinary times, technological problems may happen. You know, Wi-Fi, broadband, all the rest of it. So if anything like that does happen, we'll do our best to keep going. Um, but I would ask for your forbearance before we start. So thank you. Um, I can now start the formal proceedings of our AGM. Uh, in accordance with regulations introduced four years ago governing the operation of collecting societies, I can confirm that the non-executive members of the ALCS board meet periodically to monitor the performance of the management and to ensure that the policies approved by the members are being implemented. I am pleased to say that there are no issues or concerns regarding these matters to report to the members. Voting today will all be done online through the website you are now logged into. A number of members have already voted on the agenda items and these will be taken into account in the voting. If you have already voted, you will not be able to vote again today. There will be notifications that pop up on your screen when voting for an agenda item is open. If you'd like to ask a question during the course of the meeting, please use the chat icon in the bottom right hand corner of your browser window, which looks like a speech bubble, and we'll do our best to answer as many questions as we can. And now to begin, the first item of formal business is the director's report. I would now like to introduce you to Mark Bispham, our group financial officer. Mark will present our statutory accounts and I propose that we take questions on both the director's report and accounts after his presentation. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It is my role to give you an overview of the financial results of the company for the year to the 31st of March, 2020. Hopefully you will already have si had sight of the detail of the director's report and accounts that are included in the annual report and are also available on the ALCS website and this site. So I intend just to run through a brief summary of the main highlights of the year. Although license income decreased marginally by 1% to 36.4 million, this remains our second best ever year and our 10th in a row of collecting over 30 million pounds. We collected money from 33 different countries as far afield as the United States of America and New Zealand, from Canada to Japan. We distributed a record 36.8 million pounds to our members, 5% more than last year. This included half a million pounds from gains on our investment portfolio. Since ALCS started, we have now collected and distributed over 500 million pounds of secondary royalty income to our members, authors and their beneficiaries. Investment income was £1.1 million this year, which covered about 25% of our cost base. We use this income to defray expenses, which helps to keep our commission rates as low as possible. At the end of March, the fair market value of our portfolio was half a million pounds more than the cost, despite the amount distributed above. However, because this was significantly lower than, than at the end of March the previous year, our income statement shows a loss. 
I should emphasize that this is just an accounting convention on the treatment of unrealized gains. If we now look at the trend of results over the last 10 years, the increases in the key figures clearly show the progress we have made over that period. License income has increased by 32% and royalties paid by 49%. Despite all the system improvements we have made and our membership growing by 67%, our costs through this period have been kept under control, rising by 39%. Moving on now to the statement of financial position, this shows the company's assets and liabilities at 31st of March, 2020. Our total assets decreased by 5.6% to 43.5 million. The main elements of this are our investments and cash holdings. During the year, following an independent investment review, the board decided to rebalance some of the portfolio reducing our exposure and equities and repurposing £5 million into a specific socially responsible investment fund. This also helped to reduce the overall risk of profile of the whole portfolio. All of our investments are made using a medium to long term horizon with a view to maintaining the value of our assets in real terms and delivering an income which, as I mentioned earlier, is used to keep commission rates down. Our creditors increased slightly during the year to £40.6 million, the vast majority of which consists of the writer's fund. Finally, our total reserves stand at £2.9 million, of which half a million pounds was the unrealised surplus on our investments at year end. I think you will agree that once again we have an excellent set of results and I therefore commend these accounts to the members. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Mark. Um, we're just going to see if you've had any questions on the report and accounts while we've been presenting. This will take a little while, um, so do bear with us. I, I might say as well that there's some slightly strange tapping on my soundtrack there, it was as if someone was tapping on a keyboard that was being picked up. So apologies if anyone else is picking that up as well. But uh, do we have any questions? Oh, yeah. We've had we've had a couple of questions actually, Tony. Um, start with one, maybe for you, Mark. What is Feta Investments? Okay, uh, thanks Owen. Feta Investments was a small joint venture company we set up some years ago along with the publishers licensing services to look at potential partnership opportunities for growing collective licensing. However, after a number of years of it not being used, we made the decision to change it to a dormant, dormant company, which is how it now sits. It's no longer in use. Okay, thanks for that. We've had another question. Uh, can ALSS explain why the pandemic will reduce payments to authors uh, as the income comes from licensing arrangements which are still in place? Maybe I could start with that and Mark, maybe you add to it. A lot of the licensing we do is voluntary licensing. For example, we license the business sector. That's been particularly hard hit by the pandemic. What this has meant is that some organisations haven't taken out licences uh, some organisations have reduced their headcount, which has actually lowered the uh, fee paid as it's on a full-time employee equivalent. On the audiovisual side, some of the income we get is actually based on advertising revenue from TV stations. And there, if advertising revenue has gone down, then we see a hit in that as well. So there's a, say at the minute we're looking at actually probably around about a reduction of five to 7% for this year. So it's looking slightly better as the year goes on, but we are still forecasting a fall. Yeah, and I think, I think a lot of our income in the UK comes from education that's been relatively unaffected. But if you look at specific parts of that, like language schools, have had no income all year and do all their business through the summer uh, when travel was really restricted. So effectively one chunk of our business um, just had no, no business whatsoever. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Owen and Mark for that. Um, uh, I don't think we've got any more questions. So uh, uh, as there are no more, let's open the vote on that item. The option to vote on this agenda item should now have appeared on your browser window. So please follow the instructions. And if you forgive me, I've got my laptop set up next to me so I can see that as well. That's why I keep looking that way. Um, please be aware that you can change your mind on the vote, but the vote that you have selected when I 
finally close the vote will be the one that is recorded. Your votes will be combined with the votes that we've received from members in advance. If you did vote in advance, uh, you won't be able to vote as live now. Okay, so the voting is open. Uh, and it's coming along. Um, we have had another question that we received in advance, um, which is about the lack of diversity in the ALCS Board of Directors and what, if anything, we are doing to address this. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's been an issue for us. I think as writers, uh, we're all concerned um, to, to, to make sure that we represent as broad a spectrum of the membership as possible. Um, our membership does tend to skew older and white, but you know, it, it's very important. And I think we're all very concerned about that. We will be um, looking at it uh, more closely this year. We, uh, we're uh, losing one of our co-opted directors, Michael Redpath is stepping down uh, in the spring. So we will have a, a vacancy that we'll be looking to fill and um, diversity is, is really at the forefront of our minds for that. Um, uh, so it's definitely on our, on our radar. Um, I don't know if I went to anything to add to that. No, I think I'd say that it was discussed at the board yesterday, I know, yeah. so it is very much at the forefront. Yeah. So, but uh, thank you for raising it, it's a very important question. Um, we have also had a question about what progress we've made towards licensing digital uses, as well as protecting copyright online. I think that's definitely on Friday. Thanks, Tony. Uh, actually, it's a question we're routinely asked, and actually, in terms of our advocacy, we continue to lobby for the strongest protection online, and as a collecting society, we do encourage licensed use of all content, digital or analog. Um, with our partner organization, the Copyright Licensing Agency, they do have a couple of digital platforms now in the school sector and the HE sector. And I know that the Educational Recording Agency in the UK is also looking at a digital platform. As ALCS, we don't actually monitor illegal use or develop tools for protecting uh, copyright online but I think there please talk to your publisher or your producer on that and we will continue to look for opportunities to maximize um, income in the digital arena. Okay the votes are still coming in um, we're getting there uh, but we have had another question from Steve Walgar um, who says we mentioned the effects of the pandemic on authors incomes but I have seen various reports suggesting book sales in general have risen significantly during the pandemic, is this right? Uh, you're absolutely right, Steve. I mean, in it, the, the interesting thing about ALCS is that it was a very wide range of um, rights, books, TV, film, radio programs, poetry. Uh, and if you think about the whole span of, of, um, uh, of printed and visual material that, that, ha that has, it's based on copyright, it's a vast range. So yes, as ever, some things have done well, some things have not done so well. I know education publishers took a real hit in the uh, spring and summer, um, but ebooks came back. They'd been plateauing and falling a little bit, but people wanted to read fiction, so that came back. Hardback fiction seems to have done very well. Children's books have seemed to have done very well. Um, some of those don't balance out the losses that have happened in other sectors. So it's kind of swings and roundabouts. And I think when Owen talks about this year, maybe having a five to seven percent drop you'll see that some sectors will actually do better. Some people will actually have slightly better payments this year than last year, but that, that's the way it works in, in, our, in our world. And I think writers will recognize that from their own incomes. Um, yeah, we're, we're getting there. I'm gonna give you a bit longer. Um, I think you're ready to uh, close actually, Tony. I think that's fine. Yeah, ready to close. I think we're pretty much there, yeah. And a couple more seconds, if anyone still wants to vote. Uh, three, two, one, I think I'll close the voting now. Thank you. So that one's closed. We've got to wait a few seconds while the, the uh, technology does the adding up. <laughs> yep. We all had a lot of moments like this, haven't we, this year? Staring at screens, waiting for things to happen. There we go, yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we've got the, the proxy votes have been added in and the um, votes in advance. And we do have um, uh, uh, 4024. So yes, I can confirm the vote. Uh, the 2019-20 uh, directors report and accounts have been adopted. So thank you very much for that. Okay, moving on to the next agenda item. Uh, I'm gonna pass you over to Owen again uh, to talk about the annual transparency report. 
Thank you, Tony. And in addition to the accounts, the AGM papers also included the ALCS Annual Transparency Report, which is a requirement of UK regulations that came into force four years ago, implementing the EU Collective Rights Management Directive. The regulations are fairly prescriptive and in compiling the information, we have tried to present information drawn from the financial statements and the annual report in a format that both fits with the regulations, but actually more importantly, conveys useful information to you, our members. To this end, we've worked with other organizations within the sector, as well as the Intellectual Property Office. Thanks, Owen. Uh, we're just going to see if we've had any questions on the ATR uh, while I've been presenting. Um, bear with us for a moment. Yeah, I think uh, if I have one question, let me just see. Uh, someone's asked about, do we only UK publish material? Not, yeah. uh, in answer to that, yes, we, we only license UK published or in the audiovisual sector, UK productions or co-productions, co-UK productions. Um, however, we do receive income from overseas for... Uh, for example, um, books that are actually published in other countries, particularly in the EU, um, and uh, that's paid for you in your uh, normal distributions. Okay, thanks. Well, I, I don't think we've got any other questions at the moment, so let's open the voting on the ATR. Um, you can now vote. It should be in your browser. Once again, so please follow the instructions. Yeah, it's saying it's up there. Um, while we wait for those votes to come in, uh, we've received another general question. If new member states join the EU, does ALC, do ALCS members need to do anything to get their ALCS fees from those countries? So I think that, that's another one for you, Owen. Uh, the answer is no. Uh, the only thing we ask of members is that they register their works. Um, if they can do that through the members area of the website, fantastic. But please just keep registering your works. We have a range of international agreements not just within the EU, but actually globally. And we actually um, track and collect fees for UK works um, already in the EU and beyond. So nothing to do. Okay, with um, we, we had another question. Since libraries were closed due to lockdown, many people listen to audiobooks. LCS Society remunerate on this. Um, uh, that's for PLR, really. That's a PLR question. And it's important to keep our PLR and ALCS separate in your minds. We're different organisations, although ALCS, of course, supports PLR. Um, and audiobook remuneration was finally included a couple of years ago, I think, was it? It's e-books as well now. So, so that's where you will get any audiobook remuneration. Uh, I, I'm not sure we do any others, do we, Owen? We don't. We, we get small amounts of payments, um, particularly from countries like the Netherlands, for the lending of audiobooks. So if there are any uh, UK works which are actually in Dutch libraries, then um, we would actually receive payments for those. Okay, good. Uh, yeah, voting's going on, coming in. Um, yeah, do we have any more questions? Um, oh, we did have another a question um, kind of very related to this year. Uh, will future AGMs be online regardless of COVID? <laughs> I mean, I, my view actually is like a lot of things. I think we, we're gonna be moving into a, a, a more flexible world. I was saying to Owen the other day, actually, it, it, it could really be possible to have a hybrid AGM. I think we'd all like to be back in places where we can meet as human beings in, in rooms. And, and I think the, the thing we're all missing, certainly from the board and, the, and staff this year, is the opportunity to meet um, uh, members and, and, and have a, a drink and a canapé before and a chat afterwards. Um, but, I, you know, it, it, the online stuff works. And I, I like to think that in the future, we might have a proper board, board, uh, proper AGM and uh, we could have people coming in from uh, online, you know, we could have people commenting from overseas or, you know, other members. Uh, <clears throat> and I, I quite like that idea, but, you know, we'll, we'll have to see how things pan out. I don't know if Owen's got a view on that. No, just uh, actually, and I do think actually, you know, one thing we are missing is the opportunity to actually meet with members. AGMs give us a fantastic opportunity for that. But we've learned a lot during COVID. Uh, Let's just hope COVID finishes soon and we get back to some normality. Yeah. Um, I can see that I think most of the voting is in now. I'll, I'll give you a few more seconds. Where I think we're up to about the same sort of percentage we had on the last one. Um, a couple more seconds. Uh, and then I think I'm going to close it. Three, two, one. 
Uh, I think we'll close that one now. So we'll just wait for the, uh, the technological uh, gnomes to run around inside the computer and do their, their work. <laughs> uh, and deliver the result. Um, should be coming through soon, yeah. Should be coming through soon. I love technology, it's so quick. It really is. There we go. I don't think we've had any other questions on anything like that, but uh, there you go. Uh, that vote has also been uh, carried. The ATR, uh, I can confirm that the annual transparency report for 2019 to 2020 uh, has been received and adopted. So thank you very much for that. Okay, so we're now moving on to the third item of our formal proceedings, which is about the reappointment of the auditors. Um, so you can ask questions on this um, now before we vote, if you like. Are there any questions um, on that? I think we, we do have one for Mark. Why do you replace your auditors so frequently? Um, I think it's, it's good practice too, really. In the sort of major PLC world, um, audit firms have to change every 10 years and the audit partner every five. We actually change ours rather more frequently than that. We appoint our auditors for a term of three years. And if everything's satisfactory, they can do another three years after that. So a maximum of six. But I also think there's a huge benefit in bringing fresh pairs of eyes in on a fairly regular basis because accounting policies change, accounting means change, and just getting a fresh set of eyes to oversee the accounts gives you an extra level of assurance. So that's why we continue to do that. Uh, thank you, Mark. That's great. Um, I don't think we've got any other questions on the appointment of the auditors. So let's open the voting on this item. Um, as you can see in your browser, follow the instructions again. And the agenda item is to reappoint Messrs Shipley's LLP uh, of London as auditors of the company and to authorise the directors to fix their remuneration. So if, if you could vote on that, I'd be very grateful. Uh, we have had another question in from uh, uh, my friend Beverly and I do. Hello, Beverly. Uh, good to uh, have you here. I wish I could see you and I'm waving. Um, Beverly has asked, if work is translated to other languages from English, do we need to register the translated ISBNs? Uh, I think, I mean, I, I get asked this a lot by, by my mates in um, uh, the world of uh, writing. And generally, I think the answer for ALTS is, is the more, more data you can give us, the better, actually. Generally, the money arrives with data. It arrives particularly from overseas. And it says these are the books that have been um, uh, used and therefore this is the money that goes with them. So, you know, we will find you because we have the data and, and your, your name. Sometimes, clearly, that doesn't happen. You know, countries send money and that don't have the right data or don't have any data with it. So if we have your data already, that will help in, in apportioning the money that's due to you. So, uh, so I think, yes, it's not absolutely necessary, but it, it's very, very helpful. And that as well actually helps ALCS to build up a really terrific database of, of uh, writers and members' works. So I don't know if Owen wants to add anything to that. Or, so. I could just echo that. Um, actually, the more information we have, uh, the less work we actually have to do manual through our sort of um, books team and actually identifying the contributors to work. So, you know, there's absolutely no harm in actually registering those works at the same time. You know, I know that writers are very busy and everything, so if you don't, we will actually still go out and actually identify the writers of those translated works. Yeah, great, good. Um, the voting is coming along very well, um, uh, but um, while we're waiting, I thought I'd, I'd just like to, at this point, uh, underscore what I said in, in my uh, little film video at the beginning, uh, is that we're all, particularly the board, but I think the senior leadership team as well, we're all proud of the way all the staff at ALCS, from you know, Owen to, down to everybody uh, on the shop floor, as it were, has really pulled together and adapted to working from home. I mean, I, my wife says to me, I, I, I went through a couple of days when lockdown started. I just couldn't believe it. I thought, you know, it's just, this isn't happening. Meanwhile, the ALCS team had actually gone up, you know, gone back to their homes, sorted things out, and were up and running within days. And I, I was really amazed. They did a fantastic job. Uh, and I think we, we all need to thank them for that. And they've actually been working incredibly efficiently, but also at the same time, um, keeping together. Barbara and the team have worked very hard at, at the social side of it. 
I drop in on, on Friday afternoon drinks, which is always a cup of tea anyway. So it's not, nothing particularly exciting, but it's nice to see people. And actually it, it's been really good. You know, I think that the actual the ethos and the community spirit of the company has actually increased. Maybe that's the same in other organizations, but um, no, it has been terrific. And clearly um, it, once it's over, once things begin to, to, to get back to some kind of normality, uh, I and the team and the board will actually be looking very closely at future working structure because, as I said earlier, you know, it might be different. There might be hybrid ways of working. You know, we might have you know working from home as part of the structure, more flexibility. I would say I think that ALS is a great company to work for anyway. I think we have very very low churn rate in terms of staff. People stay for a long time. Um, so flexibility has always been part of it, but clearly we'll be looking at that. And also, I know Owen, one of the first things he did when we had the um, lockdown was start looking at costs and how we can cut back on costs um, to keep um, uh, the expenditure down and therefore keep the, the commission rate uh, at a very low level. So all of those things are on our minds. And yeah, we were talking again yesterday at a board meeting. So uh, I would just like publicly here to thank Owen and the team for doing such a great job. Thanks, Tony. Uh, we're now, uh, yeah, that's pretty good. The vote is there. Uh, I'll give you a couple more seconds. Uh, three, two, one. That's it. That vote is now closed. So we'll just wait for that to be uh, totted up. Um, just to add to what don't you want said, any legal Tony, challenges. Oh, sorry. So just to add to what you said, I mean, I think we're quite proud. We've got one of the lowest commission rates. It's, uh, you know, it's a nine and a half percent sort of base rate. And we're quite proud that that's one of the lowest of any UK collecting societies. And it means more money goes back to writers. And it's really important, particularly this time, we get as much as possible out to writers. Definitely. Thank you. Uh, I think the, the vote's been tallied. Um, and as I was just saying, we, we don't want any legal challenges for illegal votes. And I'm not going to go off in assault or anything. So uh, um, that um, item has been passed as well. So I can confirm that Messrs Shipley's LLP uh, of London will be reappointed as auditors of the company and the directors will fix their remuneration. So thank you very much for that indeed. Okay, and the next item on the agenda uh, of our, for our formal business is the director's fees for 2020 to 21. The remuneration committee of the board has recommended that the remuneration paid to directors for 2021 uh, should be increased in line with the rate of inflation at that time by 1.8% from the uh, rate set for 2019 to 20. The annual accounts and transparency report set out the level of payments made to directors during the 2019-20 financial year. Um, let's see if we had any questions on that. I've got nothing coming up on my screen. Uh, do we have any before? I don't think we did, do we, Owen? Uh, I'm just checking. I thought there may be questions. Um, one thing I would say on that is we do regularly benchmark um, against broadly sort of similar organizations, as Tony says, uh, and we do come in usually at the lower end of the benchmark. So uh, just- and I, I want to add to that, that they are benchmarked. And I, I'd also like to our board very, very hard indeed. You know, it's a highly responsible job. Um, <clears throat> you know, we're a board of a company with an income that's bigger than a lot of independent publishers. You know, it's a sizable operation. And we do have a, a big share in a copyright licensing agency from where two thirds of our income is derived, which is an 85, 86 million pound company. So some of the debates, decisions, the legal responsibility for directors is, 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 is very, very high. You know? So um, they deserve what they get paid. It's not enormous. It's, it's benchmarked against similar. So I think really this year, I'd like them for their hard work and the support they've given me and the, the, the uh, team at ALCS. Um, we really do, we are really a company that's based on the idea that you should get paid for what you do. Um, and, and that accounts for everybody, I think, writers and, and the people who are uh, helping to make sure that um, ALCS <clears throat> collects money for writers and, and distributes it. Um, so uh, let's open the voting on that. Uh, it's coming along. Uh, we have had one more question from uh, Mr. Louis Greenberg. Um, can you explain the large discrepancy between the CEO and other directors' remuneration? 
I mean, I can I can address that, and, and perhaps Owen can say something as well. But um, Owen is, is full time CEO, and, and uh, he's a real asset to the company. He's been with us for for a long time, twenty two years, I think, and CEO for fifteen. Uh, he works incredibly hard. He's worked even harder this year. Um, and we as directors, we're part timers. You know, I do one day a week, more or less, a bit, a bit more sometimes. And the uh, the directors have um, uh, on the board actually um, uh, have five board meetings, committee meetings, quite quite hard, but they, they, they are much, much lower level on those directors. Um, we actually had an exercise yesterday, we were looking at gender pay gap and salaries across the company as a whole at um, uh, one of our meetings and looking at it, and it's pretty fair overall. Yeah, I think um, we all agree, and Owen's salary is benchmarked as all the other uh, um, SLT is benchmarked as well. So we, we'd be happy to defend um, defend that i think they'll get they get a decent pay for doing a terrific job for us but thank you for that question uh i don't think any, it, there's anything else to say on that is there a, no it's, it's fine yeah. Yeah. uh yeah the votes are coming in that's very good um do we have any other questions i don't think we did uh, oh yeah we've got one on uh, quite a large proportion of the alcs membership is semi-retired the COVID policy for the self-employed has not has been not to offer any support at all to writers and creators whose self-employed income per annum is lower than their annual pension. Have ALCS been trying to lobby the relevant authorities to remedy this anomaly, and or could they do so in the future if they haven't already? Uh, Owen, on that one, I think. Oh, yeah, I think I agree. I think the government response has actually been appalling to creators. Um, at ALCS, we have lobbied consistently and campaigned to have this addressed um, throughout the whole period of the uh, pandemic and the lockdown. As we've worked with other organisations as well, the Society of Authors, the Writers Guild, on this. We will continue to make this point. I think, as you said earlier, something we did was to actually make a large donation to the Society of Authors Emergency Fund, because we knew that there were actually a lot of writers suffering out there. But on that point, we will continue to campaign uh, for this to be addressed by the government. Yeah, I definitely support that. I think we all need to get together to campaign on behalf of writers. And we did talk to the other writers organisations about that. Uh, and I did have another question that came in advance. Um, it's one for you, Mark, I think. What has happened to uh, the investments LCS has with the stock market due to COVID this year? Oh, OK, that's interesting, yes. Um, well, obviously, initially in sort of February, March, uh, our investments fell quite heavily, as we saw in the in the balance sheet and the unrealised gain uh, year on year. It dropped to the unrealised gain dropped to about half a million pounds overall. Um, with the stock market recovery since then and, and everything that's happening at the beginning of this month, the unrealised gain was three point three million without our having put any more money in. So. All our investments are medium term when we take those peaks and troughs it's most important to retain the real value in real terms um so they dipped and they came back i think the point to make about investments as well is um that the investments we went into investments uh, 10 years ago um really uh, as a means of um generating income for the company to keep the overhead down so that's what they're for, is there to generate some money which will help to keep our costs down so that writers can get more money. Um, and that's what it's been. This year has been hard because clearly uh, interest rates are at an all time low and dividends have been stopped. So uh, we've, we've lost some income on that, which uh, we, again, we were talking about yesterday, getting the balance right. That will come back. Um, uh, I think we were saying yesterday, Mark, weren't we? Uh, but it'll take time. So. The other thing about the investments is it really does make uh, ALCS a very secure company. ALCS has paid out over half a billion pounds in 42 years to a vast number of writers. We now have over 110,000 members um, since Owen made his video and uh, we want that to continue. We want ALCS to be around for another 40 years to pay out even more, another half a billion to even more writers. So th that's the benefit of having a company like ALCS with the security for security that house we're right that house, we've got it this is our company and it will continue to support our community 
So um, it does involve a lot of, you know, kind of head scratching and, and, and deep thought and long discussions at the board. And, and we do talk about it a lot, but th those are the reasons. Uh, and I think actually um, through the prudent management of the, of the team, uh, we're in a very good place, which is a good thing to be able to say for writers um, at this time. So we had a couple more um, questions. One from Claire Cooper who asked about what are our benchmarking criteria? Uh, I, I don't think we've got time to go into the detail, but I can assure you that uh, we benchmark with an external consultant that, that specialises in this area. So we get independent advice on that. And that goes via the uh, remuneration committee, uh, which looks at it, uh, and then we take it to the board. So it's all done. We, we have a real process, a very solid process on that. And my friend Nicolette, hello, Nicolette, uh, Nicolette Jones, asks if we feel that government is on the whole responding well to our lobbying. That's an interesting question. Owen, I, what do you think? I have to say, you know, um, they're listening, but they're not acting at the moment, to be honest with you. And I think most sectors are finding that. Uh, I, as if, all I can just say is we hope and expect that they will do more for creators. Um, you know, and I think next year is going to be tough for a lot of people as well, which is why continuing to lobby on these things. The good thing is actually that we are getting uh, time, although at times remote with ministers, uh, we are getting those messages across. So I'm going to keep fingers crossed, touch wood, that they actually act on that. Yeah. Uh, we, we get a lot of money from our education licenses. and I, I have a lot to do with schools as a children's writer. So I feel like my, my response to that would be um, could do better government um uh could a lot better and and don't come back to me and say that the dog's eating your homework because it's not satisfactory but we'll we'll keep on their case on that one i think uh okay good i think we can uh get to the point of closing the vote on uh, on this item uh yeah a couple more seconds three two one i'm going to close that vote so thank you very much uh not sure if we had any other questions at the moment. What have we got? Uh, Just to go back to that earlier point, Tony, on the on the lobbying, I think it's fair to say that Barbara, who appeared in the video, does an excellent job at yeah. keeping ALCS and our members at the forefront of governors, uh, government's minds, yeah. even if they don't actually respond very well. Yeah, I'm trying. I'm trying to be really neutral and chairman-like about all this. You know, I'm bubbling under with you know um, some some criticisms of government performance in this area for our, for our members um but i do think in barbara i mean i've heard a lot of stuff about world beating and exceptional this and exceptional that this year we do have a world beating lobbying operation actually um which barbara's created and manages with her team they're all really really good they do a brilliant job so and, and that's exceptional uh okay thank you uh i can confirm that uh item four has been passed um, and so uh, I can confirm that directors of fees have been approved at the rate set for 2020 to 21. So thank you very much for that. Thank you. Um, that concludes the formal business of our AGM, but I'm now going to address a few more of the questions that you've been asking throughout the meeting. Uh, don't forget, if you've got a question you'd like to ask, now's your chance. As before, please use the chat function and submit your question. We'll try and answer everything, um, but we, we're doing a little bit of managing on that because you want to answer the same questions or, or questions that aren't strictly relevant to the membership. I mean, I'm, I think we had a few more in, didn't we, still, in advance? Yep. This is all the script. Or have we run well, out of questions? We've had a question on Brexit, actually, Tony, shall I do with that one? Um, yeah. yeah, that'd be good. Yeah. Uh, the question is actually an update on how ALCS is preparing for Brexit. <coughs> Thank you, pardon. Um, actually, since 2016 and the vote, we've been working really closely with all our EU partner organisations just to look to ensure that actually payments continue to flow seamlessly back to the UK and back to members. Of course, we don't know what is going to be in the new trade agreement, but we have been working with the Intellectual Property Office, trying to make sure that certain protections are in place. Um, with regards to, I'd say the pandemic has actually, to a certain extent, put Brexit on the back burner. But next year, we will be going out talking with all our key partners, continuing to build relationships because it's so important this money comes back. We actually get about 40% of our income from overseas that actually um, comes back to you, our members. So 
it's very much a priority for us. And um, actually our partners have been uh, actually working well and very understandable on the changes that are taking place. Thanks, Dan. That's, that's a very good answer. Um, I don't think we've got any more questions, actually. I think we've, we've answered everything and, and um, we didn't really have any other questions in advance that we've covered. I think we've covered just about everything. So I think we can finish our AGM here. Uh, I just wanted to say a, a huge thank you to everybody who's come today um, virtually. Um, it's, it's, it's really good to see the, uh, the numbers there on my screen. And thank you for, for your votes and, and passing those uh, agenda items. Um, I really do hope that you know, things are better next year, that, you know, that, that things improve and we can have a proper AGM and get to meet you uh, in person and, um, and tell you uh, in person about um, what AOSS will be doing over the next year. But I can reassure you that we will be working very, very hard on behalf of our members uh, on right, for writers in general, and, and we'll, we'll continue to keep collecting money and distributing it as efficiently as possible. So thanks again for coming and um, goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Yep. Cheers.